<laughs> Nobody else is cooperating. All right. Uh, we'll ask you to speak up. Uh, oh, wait, we've got more. Come on. Great. Uh, so I want to uh, welcome you all to Let's Talk About Context Baby. Uh, my name is Bill Bregan. Uh, I am proud to be a board member of the Association of Performing Arts Presenters, and um, uh, I've been a long-standing member of the conference committee, and uh, I have recently moved from being a festival presenter to being a university presenter, and so a lot of the issues about uh, doing contextualization work and having, uh, having the opportunity to have much more deeply engaged uh, artists' uh, relationships has been a big part of my personal transition. So this, this panel is really meaningful to me, uh, very personally, and a lot of ideas that I think we're gonna be talking about are ideas that have been very much on my mind uh, as I make this transition, and I am very proud to share the panel with these uh, three fantastic colleagues who, uh, who I think are really kind of exemplary in terms of the kind of work that they do. Uh, we've got about 90 minutes, and uh, because my general feeling is in these kinds of APAP panels that, uh, that there's a lot of expertise here, but there's a lot of expertise mm -hmm. everywhere we look. So we're gonna spend probably the first half, maybe a little bit less, on sort of the moderated conversation, but really open it up to everybody so it's a room-wide conversation. Uh, but at any point in the non-Q&A non sort of part of the conversation, you've got a comment, you've got a thought, you've got a question, you've got something that any of you want to add or amplify or question or challenge, uh, please feel free to do that. Uh, just give them a moment so they can turn the camera around and capture, uh, capture you on the, on the live stream on HowlRound as well. And uh, if you are live <coughs> tweeting it, hashtag APAPNYC, also at HowlRound, and it's HowlRound.tv is where people can stream it if you wanna spread it out to your world. Uh, so I wanna just start very quickly and ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves uh, very briefly and just quickly talk about, uh, in the introduction, the role that contextualization work plays in their work. So we will start uh, directly <laughs> to my right with Jackie Chang from Brick, which is Brooklyn, it's just in, brick. information. It's just brick. Brick. We just celebrate Brooklyn <laughs> yeah. and Brick House. It's also. brick arts so. um, media. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Jackie Chang. I'm the director of education at Brick, and we are a multi um, arts organization in downtown Brooklyn. We are the largest um, presenter of free cultural um, programming in Brooklyn, and one of the biggest in the city. Every year we engage over hundreds and thousands of um, people through our programming at Brick, House, Brick Arts Media House. And um, we have facilities for two performing arts spaces, a media center, three TV studios, and a 3,000 square foot contemporary arts gallery. Um, we also do offsite programming at um, venues like the um, Prospect Park where we do the Brick Celebrate Brooklyn Festival annually, as well as programming in libraries and schools throughout Brooklyn. All right, and to her right, Martha Redbone. Hi, everyone, I'm Martha Redbone. I'm a singer-songwriter, and um, I have a, a project, I have a project called The Roots Project where um, I decided to kind of explore um, my background, my family culture, which is uh, a mix of Native American, Afri African American, and European stories uh, for my family through music and um, and community outreach as well. And uh, and I'm really pleased with the journey and kind of in awe as well as as, as um, I realized through my own story that. My, I'm also telling other people's stories as well, and um, and it's really cool because I grew up kind of um, getting into a lot of fights about um, our culture at home and and the existence of Native Americans and and then when I share the stories with people, um, I notice that the world is a lot smaller place than I realized and and um, and through that. Um, I'm able to communicate with younger people, people on reservations, people around the world, in other countries, and kind of um, retell our stories from the horse's mouth because 
what people have been taught in history books in schools, um, what little they've been taught has been a lie. So um, it's kind of up to the people of the communities to share our own family story. So, and that's kind of the journey that I've been on for the past few years. So. And what she's, and what she's not saying is that uh, <laughs> while she's historically done this mostly for music, she's now also doing this through theater, her show, Bone Hill, uh, has been developed by the Public Theater in Joe's Pub, and it was part of Under the Radar. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> exemplifies all of what she was just saying. Like, <laughs> all right, and Margaret. I'm Margaret Lawrence. I'm the Programming Director at the Hopkins Center at Dartmouth College. Um, we're a year-round multidisciplinary uh, performing arts center. Um, and um, we are serving both the campus itself as part of the educational process um, for the students, and uh, but then also the community. We're kind of the big, the big deal for 100 mile radius in that regard. And um, so a lot of what we do is um, looking for really diverse um, both art forms and forms of expression orientations, backgrounds, ideas, um, knowing that the. Camp, the community outside of the Dartmouth campus, which is very diverse, is, as we say, economically diverse, but that's kind of it. So the expressions that we're bringing in many cases are people's very first introduction to, to a particular culture or a particular artist. Um, we've been very uh, honored to work with Martha and have, continue to have a relationship with her, and um, I'll be talking today about um, kind of a case study of a residency in terms of how we approach <coughs> contextualizing what we do. And uh, I'm, Bre I'm Bill Bregan. I'm currently the Executive Artistic Director of the Art Center at NYU in Abu Dhabi. It's a, uh, it's a brand new performing arts center at a brand new university on a brand new island in a fairly new country in, uh, <laughs> in the Gulf. Uh, and uh, this is our inaugural season. We have our brochure too, um, and we've, uh, we've been uh, very much developing things on a residency model uh, with artists coming in, the shortest for three days on average a week, uh, and in many cases for two weeks, and a lot of the ideas that we've been experimenting with, uh, I've been, I think, kind of borrowing and stealing and pilfering from people like Margaret especially, <laughs> and a lot of the sort of creative campus conversations that have been happening uh, here throughout APAP. Uh, and a lot of those programs have been really developed by our uh, videotaping colleague right back there, Mohanad al Bakri, who, uh, who's our Director of External Relations and uh, Partnerships. Uh, in addition to that, I am also one of the co-founding uh, directors of Global Fest. And so uh, we've been doing a lot of work uh, presenting a festival, a decontextualized festival, you know, but designed to stimulate touring of uh, of uh, globally based artists throughout uh, North America, and uh, and now we're also we've got a touring fund, the Global Fest Touring Fund, uh, and we also curated a tour that Cami Music is putting on the road this spring called Creole Carnival, uh, and we've been doing a lot of work with that with some of the presenters in the markets that we've been working with, uh, many of whom are presenting artists uh, from Haiti, Brazil, and Jamaica in this in this instance. Uh, for the first time and doing a lot of work to try to try to kind of develop approaches collaboratively that can help move that forward. And I'll just uh, shout out Mira Dugal who's been working with us developing a lot of those materials as well. Uh, so the first thing that I want to do since Margaret has been very much my guru for a long time is uh, is ask uh, is ask her to start off with uh, with a little bit of a case study that I think could really help frame the conversation of uh, of I think some of the best practices in the field in terms of uh, presenting artists within uh, within the university context and really creating a multifaceted uh, collaboration with the artists and with the communities. Sure. So um, we never bring artists without doing more than just the performance with them, and I think that's kind of becoming just the way that our field operates, which is a great thing. Um, but often we will try to um, hit as many points of connection with particular artists as we possibly can. The, the example that I brought with you, for you today, um, if there's, I have more up here, but I think this might be enough. But if it's not, there's more, just grab them for yourself, is uh, a band that actually I finally got to see through Global Fest, which is La Santa Cecilia from Los Angeles. Um, this is a, actually a very small residency for us. They just they were here with us for a couple of days, and then they did the concert. That's very short for us. Usually, we're doing even more than that. Um, 
uh, when we, as I said, we're really trying to help contextualize artists that won't be seen. There's really no Latino community outside the campus in northern New Hampshire. There just isn't. So, um, and for sure, the school kids in our community are not going to be like learning about immigration issues or just any of that stuff where we live. Where this is not, this is not happening. So. Um, when we do this, we are both using the university as a resource for helping set that cultural context, but then we're also very much um, inviting the artist into helping us create the context for their own traditions and their own artwork themselves. So in this case, the first thing that you have here, and I'm not gonna take you through this page by page, but this is, on top, is a study guide. Um, because we asked La Santa Cecilia to do a 10 a.m. school matinee right in the hall. And when we do that, we produce, we write and produce the study guide. And so we do that <laughs> together with them, but we wanted to make sure that the schools understand like what is a corrido, you know, what are these forms of music and where do they come from and who are these people, but also a little bit about contemporary immigration reform issues, right? Because they're not going to be hearing that really from anywhere. <laughs> and, when, and when in the process do you deliver this material? This um, we, sell, the we sell the whole school matinee series um, before the season even goes on sale. So like in May, we would sell that whole year, but then they get the steady guide about a month out. And it's online. Then the last, um, and, I'll, and, and this is the part that I really want to go through with you to show you, the last couple of pages tapped onto here, just black and white paper, are um, an outline of the actual residency. So as you go through this, you can see that they were doing, they were, the, the artists were themselves going into classes at the Dartmouth campus. They were in Spanish classes. They were meeting with student groups. Um, there's students who are actually working themselves on immigration reform, Latino students from all over the country. Um, then they did their performance, then they did a Q and A, then the next morning they did the school matinee. So that's a very small residency for us. Often we will be also calling upon um, the resources of Dartmouth, the intellectual resources like faculty, and guests from the community to you know do a public panel discussion about a particular issue. You know maybe it's global HIV in Africa because we have South African choreographer Dada Masilo who's there right now and doing a piece you know taking Swan Lake into a homophobia context, right? So these issues can get very very specific and they can lead to really really rich conversations. But this is kind of just a little lovely tip of the iceberg um, example. Maybe I'll pause there. While she's pausing, does anybody have any quick questions? Uh, I have a quick question then. Uh, what's the staff structure? How many people do you have that are working on this part of the work? Mm -hmm. And how much overlap is there with people who are working on the presentation and production side? And how do those, how do those teams intersect? Yeah. Well, the production end is really about the show, and in this case, the school matinee, since it's in the very same stage the next morning, it's pretty much the same um, as a show. And, um, but we do have, don't, please don't hate me. We are really fortunate right now to have an, have an educational team of more than four people, aside from me as the programmer and a programming assistant who does all the contracting and all the grant support work, because I'm also the grant writer. The reason we have that many people, though, is partly because of these, which are, you know, residencies are very resource intensive, um, but we also have a tremendous number of other programs that I'm not even talking about. So we have, you know, whole community projects with soft funding coming in from grants, and we have um, the school matinee series is actually the responsibility of part of one of those educational staff members world, right? So that's a big chunk of what she does. It's not all what she does, but it's part of it. <laughs> Um, when I uh, make the first initiative to invite a group like La Santa Cecilia, I often have a, a general impression of the kinds of things that I know I want them to do, but, um, but my lead um, educational director, Stephanie Pacheco, who I think you know, is usually right in there with me and we're thinking it through because the, one of the very first things, as probably all of you know, is not only to make the commitment, but then to like probably write a grant for it. <laughs> so we have to kind of know where we're heading with these contextual ideas, even as we ask for the funds to support the engagement. So the planning happens very early. And, and how much of the how much of the the, kind of the outline of what this residency will be is taking place before the offer stage or before the contracting stage? Kind of where within the timeline of yep. the season planning are you starting to put this? Yeah, so let's say the offer is going on like right now for next year. I would already know that I need two days of residency. I'll, I'll be really explicit in my offer, like arriving by the night of this and ready to jump in the next morning. 
and I'll say maybe they'll be doing residency activities, TBD, to include probably class visits, probably social interactions with people, maybe workshops, whatever. So we'll kind of hold that time, we'll hold like maybe three activities a day, we don't know what they are. We'll definitely know about the school matinee. And, um, and then as we, it doesn't all have to be explicit in the contract, but the timing obviously of when they arrive and the nature of what they're doing there is talked about in order to be in the contract. And then, you know, once the contract is signed, then we start to get more and more specific and that's all kind of, often it's directly with the artists. Mm -hmm. And is three, is three events a day, is that that's a, good, a pretty common? That's a pretty that common that standard. Be, yeah. and, and in fact, if you're doing three activities a day, I would be also further explicit to say to the agent or to the artists themselves, um, you know, not all three of those would necessarily be performing kinds of things. Like one might be totally just a social thing, like a meal with students or a meal with the community or a potluck, whatever. One might be a workshop, one might be a class visit where you're actually performing. Because I think three different performative things in a day is a lot to ask. And do you have the artists, are they staying on campus? Are they staying in hotels? Kind of what's the, what's the, like the physical aspect of the relationship between the artists in residency? Uh, we're a really small town. We're like a town of 11,000 people. So we're lucky to have a really great, great, great hotel right on the campus, and we have an incredible deal there. So unless it's full, which it sometimes is, but usually, you know, usually we can finagle. They're staying on the campus in a hotel that's actually physically attached to the venue, which is pretty great. Yeah. yeah. So they are part of the community. They are also kind of bumping into people even as they go eat or just whatever. Yeah. Great. Uh, any questions before we can move on? And we're going to circle back, but I want to. I'm just kind of frame it with everybody. All right, uh, so next, uh, since we have an artist here, uh, and Martha has done a lot of deep work in these kinds of relationships uh, in lots of different kinds of venues and institutions and in more community-based uh, work as well, I wanted Martha to talk a little bit about her experience kind of working in some of these different, in these same and different kinds of settings. Right. Hi, everyone. Um, well, first of all, at Dartmouth, we had an amazing time. Um, it was a really wonderful residency. Um, we were uh, hosted the first night by the Native American Students Club. We did had a potluck dinner, and I got to meet people, uh, students from that community. And we basically just had like a, a dinner, kind of roundtable discussion on things, um, about things that, uh, that they were dealing with in their community. Um, the isolation of uh, how they feel being so far away from home. Some people had um, been on the res their whole lives, of life, and then you know here they are on campus and adjusting to that. Um, some people were dealing with um, uh, issues of sexuality and transgender things, and and the acceptance of that um, as students um, in on campus as well. Um, and then at the same time. You know, we we were all, you know, our homes were so similar to each other, even though we were all from different tribes, you know, which was really cool. So we had a, a, a really great conversation, and we could have actually talked all night long, you know, and, um, and so that was really great fun. And then um, we had some uh, lecture classes. Uh, I. When we did the residency, it was based on a project that we have an album project called um, The Garden of Love, uh, Songs of William Blake, where we set uh, the poetry of William Blake to the music of Appalachia um, in celebration of um, our family, our coal mining family from Harlan County, Kentucky. And, um, and this was really cool because um, the, uh, the, the instructors were really it was amazing. Like we talked about coal mining, the history of those mountains, um, through a perspective of that, you know the Afro Native experience. Um, it was just really women on uh, women and cultural identity, um, all kinds of things. Um, we did talks about, and um, and this was in like a classroom discussion. I think well, uh, one of the classes they were actually studying uh, William Blake. Um, so that was great because they were right in it, I believe, you know. Um, and so this, as far as you know, music is concerned, I can talk. I could talk about it as a lay person, um, and also from from being from this region and a person of color who was raised in both the mountains and in Brooklyn as well. Um, it was just really, really great fun. And then um, uh, we had a, a 
with your sponsors and I really, yeah. And that's where, that was amazing. <laughs> she, she, Martha went to a donor's <laughs> home and none of these um, donors knew who she was. No. And of course, like in 10 minutes, they were like singing with her. Yeah. <laughs> it was really fun. It was really great fun. And, um, and so hearing music that, you know, is only, you can only hear on NPR, you know, not top 40 and I didn't show them my navel, so, you know, it's like, you know that's pretty much the only way that people pay attention to music these days, you know, and you have to show them your belly button and make a music video with lots of cleavage and, you know, that. But, um, so that was great. I mean, we, you know, so I kind of had a visit and with all the kind of tears of the community, basically, and, um, and all in the name of, of poetry and, and this culture. And then uh, the band came in and then we had a, a big concert, which was received really well as, as well. And what was it, there was a lot of people at that concert, right? It was about 800 people or yeah. something like yeah. that. I mean, so it was amazing. You know, people were there to have a good time. They support the events in the, in the area. And I felt that, um, I mean, for, for us and for me as an indie artist, I felt it was a huge, absolutely huge, huge, huge success. Um, because um, people paid attention, you know, people were interested, people wanted to learn, people asked questions. It covered, you know, Dartmouth has a history of uh, being the Native American um, boarding school. Um, so, it, you know, it, that was like an ideal location for, for, for us, you know, and for, particularly for that project. Um, I'm excited to see what, you know, this new project that we're working on, Bone Hill, this kind of theatrical music, musical piece, which uh, digs in even deeper um, and to the story of America, you know. So, um, but we've done residencies like that uh, around the country, but I feel that um, s certain ones were particularly um, successful because of um, the, the Art Center's um, ability to kind of make contextual um, a, a curriculum for us to follow and for us to be able to share our stories. One of the things about artists who are doing um, music that um, represents their culture and represents and tells their story, one of the things that we love to do is to, to share our story about where we come from and how we came to be and things that you know people don't really think about when they're just grooving and having a great time. But it's something deeper to that, deeper than that. And then once you share it with them, they want to know more. And then there's this wonderful cultural exchange, you know, well our family was like this, you know, and our family was like that when we came from who knows where. And so I think um, I'm excited about, that's why I love Global Fest so much, because the, the, these are groups that come from all over the world that have a story and a message that's in their music. And, and it's, it's just, it's greater than, than just kind of something that sounds good. There's something really intrinsically deep and soulful and connected to the earth and that we all need to be a part of, you know. And, um, and I think finally for the first time, um, I think the world is ready to hear all of our stories and to not just hear it, not just listen to them, but to understand them and accept, you know, our stories from the horse's mouth, you know. So l let's talk just a little bit about that relationship. So got all these different kind of experiences that, that you were a part of at Dartmouth. Yes. How many of those ideas did you come to the table with as the artist and say, this is, this is sort of the menu of things that I like to do when I'm working with students or working in communities? How much of these are things that came from Margaret or Stephanie or the team at the Hopkins? Like, what, what's, that, uh, what's that relationship like? Yeah, there was an email exchange and then we had a talk about all the things that we cover in particular. And, um, uh, you know, like for our project, you know, I also teach um, traditional Southeastern tribal singing, so that was also, you know, something that, that I offer as part of, you know, the package if anybody wants that. And that usually works well if we have uh, community outreach in the schools. You know, um, sometimes, you know, local schools will, will go out to the school or sometimes they will bus uh, mm -hmm. kids in and we'll have like an assembly in the theater and, uh, and uh, we'll do kind of a, a talk and, and sing, uh, singing music workshop. Um, so it was basically like a list of things that we're able, that I'm able to do um, that I think I could try and do a good job at and also 
things that Margaret and, and her crew were interested in and covering as well because they know what's going on in the schools. You know, yeah, and, and we're scouring the course schedule exactly. to see like, well, what fits. There's a course, but it only meets on Wednesdays. Right. Oh no. Right. <laughs> that kind of thing. And then just on like a mechanical standpoint, you talk about so you, so you're coming in first before the rest of your band comes in. You're not all coming together. You're sort of staggering that to do the, to do the the residency activity and contextual work. It actually all depends on what is needed when mm -hmm. is needed. You know if if it so happened that. Um, you know, say there was a kids thing or something that would re require that we do like an a acoustic set or something like a stripped down version, maybe we'll have one or two guys come in, you know, if we needed everyone on the one day. We, we do, we work accordingly to however, whatever they need. Sure. We're just, I mean, for us, I feel, I, and I still feel this way, um, it's so hard to get our music out there independently. You know, we don't. I'm, I've never had the big record <coughs> deal. You know, with the, with the machine working for me. You know, I do everything. I'm the van driver. I book the flights. You know, um, finally, I don't book the gigs for the first time, and that's thanks to Global Fest. You know, but um, you know, but I'm still, you know, Shirley Partridge. Right. You know, I still that's what I do, <laughs> and um, you know, and and I'm happy to do it as well, you know, until whatever such time that it's, come that's on, right, you know, yeah. exactly. come, on, come on and get happy. Yeah. But um, we are just thankful that people are listening and people are ready to listen and to learn more and so that we can share more and learn as well. Um, so we do whatever it takes. And as far as the success, you said you, know, you performed to about 800 people in a yes. community that yeah. essentially didn't know you. Right. Uh, <coughs> In terms of ticket sales, in terms of attendance, was there a big spike once Martha started coming into the into the community? Like, do you notice that as an immediate impact? So, is this residency work? Is it about deepening the experience, or how much of it is also about uh, it's a, a being a marketing opportunity essentially and, and driving attendance at the event? For me, either. Yeah. Um, well, we want all those streams, of course, to converge, right? So it starts when we first announce the season, and I'm doing kind of live, big video pitches, and I'm actually trying right then to start to create context for her work, right? And that you can trust me, but also here's why it's important, and here's what, what her role is in this season. This is a really critical role. And then, um, so, like, let's say there's class visits, really, we're really working hard to get those teachers not just to recommend that their kids come, but to actually require it, right? right? That's, that's It's part of their education, it's experiential education. Mm -hmm. So there's that, um, and then, of course, there's these remarkable artists, so everyone that Martha talks to falls in love with her in five minutes, and that's just the way she is. And so, the more people feel like they have gotten a, a, a personal access, a personal connection to her, Th those donors showed up at the show and they already knew how to sing back because like they were her <laughs> best friend. So I mean those streams all kind of converge and we definitely see, um, we do see the impact of residencies absolutely yeah. in terms of the yeah. experience. And also I was going to just add in, um, you know, most of these places, you know, will have not heard of me, you know, if it weren't for like a platform like Global Fest or like or these, these things that are going on that we're a part of that arts presenters come to to see us, but people in those communities we've never we've never been in. So it's it's a total introduction. So the fact that you know um, something that's connected to a university that can um, bring people, they can supplement their their ticket price, make it low to encourage people to come. You know, make it part of the curriculum so that they can get a credit for it if they come and, and they sit. So you know. And then it's our job, it's my job as the artist, you know, to try to win them over. You know what I mean? To, to get you to listen. Because, you know, if they'll just sit there and kind of, you know, all right, I'll sit here for half an hour so I can get my thing stamped and then I'm on to the next thing. But to basically, uh, the, the challenge is to be able to, to win them, to win them over and to have them interested and, and hope that they like what they hear and not to come to the concert or, you know, through the workshops that we do during the day if they're really turned on by it, they'll come back and they'll bring friends, and that's the beginning of our relationship to our new audience. Yeah, you have a question. Uh, so I'm an Asian manager with South Asian artists, and I have some amazing teaching artists, and it's kind of two sides. One, I've had worked with presenters 
well, similar to the hall, will do wonderful residency work and take care of it themselves. And other times, they'll be going into a space and um, there's no correspondence with curriculum at all. So I will actually reach out to professors myself and say, hey, I have people coming through, and we'll check schedules even and go, bring your students, I'll do a free, my artist will do a free workshop with them beforehand. Because the, the presenter's not involved in that piece. But one of the challenges I've come up with, which I'm wondering if you take into consideration, um, aside from the Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, are they meeting, is where are they in their curriculum when my artist is coming yes, in? Yes, and yes. does it actually tie into, yes. like, oh, you're coming too early. I'm not at <laughs> India right now. Yeah, in and my I've heard group. that. I've heard that. Um, so do you consider that when you... We totally consider it, and we are learning from the faculty themselves, you know, what that, how that curriculum mm -hmm. flows. But I will say... Um, we share the venue with all the student performing ensembles, so we're almost like a festival. We're right at the beginning of every quarter, and then it kind of eventually gives way to student performances when they're ready. So often, our show is on the first day of classes. Like, some of those students don't even know if they're really taking that class, right? So our, but our faculty have gotten used to us because we really take them through it, and um, like in September, we had the, the great Taylor Mack, the performance artist Taylor Mack, and it was on the first day of classes, and this, he came into the class, and started to talk about gender in a way that, you know, there were like football students in this class. They didn't know what he was talking, they didn't know the terminology, whatever, it didn't matter. Then they went to the show, it blew their head off. And then, three weeks later in the course, they got to that vocabulary, all of these students already knew it. They knew it from the <coughs> artists. So here's a faculty member that sees, demonstrated, that the arts have this incredible impact on their students and that it's, it may not always line up with the order of their curriculum, but it's gonna be so rich the way it adds to their students' experience and their understanding of that actual topic. Right, mm -hmm. but yeah. part of that is because there's a relationship that's built over time with faculty are, yeah. it's okay if we're gonna go out of order for- they know, Because they know us, right. yeah. And, and I would say for, from our experience that it's, it's because it's a brand new program, we're really sort of inventing it as we go. Uh, we had, uh, for example, we had jazz saxophonist Rudrash Mahantapa uh, this past uh, this past November, uh, and there is a jazz history course that's in the spring semester. So the professor, we, we do meals, and so he came, you know, he came, and they got to they got to meet over a meal, a kind of a group community meal. Uh, but then one of the things that we did was we set up a videotaping session, so he could interview him for an hour while he was there because the arc of that class, uh, Rudresh is one of the artists that he was really using as an example of sort of where, where jazz is going and kind of what the opportunity is. So we were able to do that, but in that exchange, I also said, can you, you know, can you share your syllabus? I'm curious what else you're doing, uh, and let's see what else dovetails, and we are doing a funk project in April with Pee Wee Ellis and Fred Wesley from James Brown's band, but Pee Wee also was a protege of Sonny Rollins. And so what we realized is that they were, they were doing a unit on Sonny, uh, it didn't coincide, so the professor actually switched the syllabus and we had enough time so that now they're gonna focus on Sonny Rollins when Pee Wee, Pee -wee is gonna be in town and we met with Pee Wee actually happened to be coming through uh, this weekend so we met with him and he's gonna pull out, I think he's gonna pull out kind of recording tracks of Sonny's band and then play himself over the music. And, and, and it's all because we just started this communication with our colleagues and we've been trying to meet with different departments, with the arts and humanities and going to division meetings, uh, but then also in deans and then, and then just it's kind of word of mouth kind of discovering, oh, you should know this <coughs> faculty member because they're doing research in this, uh, and, and really just sort of uncovering sort of grassroots partners. Uh, now, a lot of what we're talking about is framed in this very specific context of the university, uh, and I think a lot of this is a little chicken and egg. I think that you know people will be doing this because it should be done. A lot of it's also been driven by kind of the funding streams in the foundation world through this sort of creative campus initiatives. Uh, Jackie is not working in a, in a university yeah. context, so it doesn't have the same kinds of kind of embedded resources in terms of faculty and student group and those kinds of things. So I'm wondering, Jackie, if you could talk a little bit about kind of working in a very different kind of arts organization right. and how, how you accomplish some of these things. Yeah, so um, what, what we do actually, I think is really kind of special and unique and has a lot to do with our organization being a multi-arts. So we have media, we have visual arts, and then we have performing arts. 
And um, what we do in terms of contextualizing is put the artist in the driver's seat. So when we do our fireworks residency, this is our current uh, residency spinning wheel with um, Baba Ben Israel. Um, he is a hip hop theater artist, but he wanted to, he, he, um, he received our uh, fireworks residency and his um, performance spinning wheel is a conversation between himself and his father who was also a performing art artist. Um, the Living Theater, um, Stephen Ben Israel, who recently died, uh, and so how we what, how we were able to allow um, Baba to have the experience of contextualizing his work further than the performance itself is that there was a gallery installation, there were also murals created, um, and he he did a um, stoop series, which is a conversation. That, um, that's at, um, on our stoop. We have the stoop area. <laughs> I can't even explain it. It's beautiful. Wait, <laughs> I might even have a picture. I could actually show it, but, um, but anyway, <laughs> to get a feel for it, this is the stoop. It's um, the architect kind of created a public <coughs> space, indoor public space, um, using the Brooklyn stoop as a way where people kind of could interact in this casual way. So um, Baba did a um, presentation with, um, about Lord um, Bentley, who is a, I don't know, if, um, he's, a lot of people consider him as the father of hip hop. So he was able to contextualize his whole um, residency <coughs> himself by doing the programming. And what we did was lend him resources, our resources, our staff, um, also our um, curatorial team, in helping him put this together and think about it, and um, and our education team. So he he's doing he's not, he's going to be doing this week a um, workshop around um, hip hop graffiti and kind of hip hop culture. So these are all his ideas actually, <laughs> and what we did was support him in doing it and making <coughs> sure that it was um, done in a way that is presentable at, at, at the highest level. So if you get a chance, please go out there and see it because it's currently up. His show, was, his um, last performance, I think was yesterday, but um, the exhibition is still up. And what he did was he took his father's archive and made a um, gallery installation and recreated his office, his father's office, and did video projections on them. So um, as, as, a, as an organization, we were able to help him do that, to kind of really do a, a a very contextualized um, arts experience for the um, viewer. It also helped us develop our, our audience by cross-pollinating. So the people who usually visit our um, exhibition space got a chance to kind of also think about seeing a performance where they may not have. Also our media, because he did so many projections and, um, and we actually captured his performance um, through our media team. So. That's basically a general idea of what we do at Brick in terms of supporting um, artists and contextualizing, putting them in the driver's seat on how they would like to contextualize their work. So my first reaction to that example is that Bob is a little exceptional because he's also, he's been an artistic director mm -hmm. and curator and ran, he yeah. ran an arts, uh, an arts organization mm -hmm. in uh, Manchester in the mm -hmm. UK. Uh, is is that a correct assumption, or you know, are there are there certain and and if you've got artists who aren't necessarily as experienced doing this kind of work, right. how do you bring them right. so that they can engage in, in a similar way if it's not been part of their career path? I know right. that with Global Fest, and when I talk to a lot of artists who've been coming up from the sort of maybe the more commercial music mm -hmm. world, where they people are used to going playing at a club and that the end of it and saying, oh, you need to think about doing this kind of residency activity. This is one way to escape having to do a daily 5 a.m. lobby call. It's a way to <laughs> fill you know, the first right. half of the week when there's no business and actually kind of sustain, kind of sustain the group physically, financially, emotionally, spiritually, all of that. Uh, and for, for some of these artists, 
it's very new to their experience. Yeah, so, yeah. so how do you work with artists who might not have that as part of their right. experience? Right. Again, I think it's the real uniqueness of um, Brick, where we have a whole curatorial team, <coughs> contemporary arts curatorial team. We have a whole team that is putting out um, work constantly in media for television. Um, so we're able to bring all these resources in and helping an artist kind of think through how they might want to contextualize. So our, our season is not just these residencies. Our season is contemporary art exhibitions, you know, TV shows that we produce, education when we're going outside and um, doing uh, media education, teaching people how to make their own TV shows. So we're doing our own things, but when we're supporting our artists and contextualizing, we're bringing all this resource to the table to help them achieve what you're talking about, to be able to go, okay. And we, we've done, Baba is only one example. We've had, um, we did the WOW opera series where um, we took Nilly Vanilli, well, the artists took the Nilly Vanilli Dorian Minion opera. But they use every single space in the gallery to do the opera so that we were in the gallery, they did a fake gallery show, you know, so it's all That's these, fun. yeah, it was, it was really fun, it was <laughs> a really, but it, we were able to, to throw our resources in, our professional resources in these different areas to help them achieve and integrate um, their vision. <coughs> so uh, where within the organization does, does this kind of work sit? Is it sitting within programming? Is it sitting within marketing? Is it sitting, is education a purely kind of self, kind of its, a, its own prong? Yeah, we, we do it all together. When we're doing these um, residency pro projects, everyone meets together to see what, no one's kind of, um, I, the performing arts team takes the lead on it. But we come together and really see how we can support it and where it fits into our programming, you know, as we plan the year out. Um, I think the Rodney King um, a presentation was also a really great example of how we can contextualize using another department or another arm of um, brick. And this um, was Roger Graham Smith's yeah, Rodney King? Yeah, so what happened was the uh, media team saw an opportunity to do a town hall meeting around the last performance, and we were eight we were able to very quickly put together a panel of not performing arts experts, but experts in, in um, police brutality, city council members, other visual artists who have done, and very quickly put this town hall together, which resulted in stopping traffic on, um, on Flatbush Avenue. Um, and it was a very powerful thing, but it was an impromptu kind of inspired. So I think that's I think that's the advantage of um, that Brick has outside of just performing arts um, organization is that we have these other things that we could draw upon and react very quickly and support artists very quickly. Great. Uh, I want to get a sense of just who's in the room now, just uh, as we move towards a maybe more open conversation. First, how many people in the room are artists? Do we have artists in the house? Okay, a couple of artists. Uh, within the kind of presenting world, how many people are involved on, in artistic stuff? Okay, uh, marketing, education, and that stuff. All right, so what about agents for arts? Yeah, agents. Manager. Manager. Yeah. Manager. Yeah. Manager. Yeah. Manager. Great. So, does anybody have any questions, thoughts, responses? Yeah. I have a question. Kind of for Margaret, but if anyone else wants to go on, uh, and the guide that you and the guide that you shared with us. Um, besides contextualizing the artist and where they're coming from and their space, and what or on the first page, the very first thing is sort of also contextualizing for the people coming in the theatrical space that they're coming into. Um, and I want to know if you could talk a little bit about that, but also is that something that you primarily do for these like outreach efforts to schools and non-traditional audiences, or is that something that you also see yourself either doing or wanting to do with your traditional audiences? Great question. So, did anybody not get this? There's more up here if you didn't get this packet. 
So we have this in, inside cover page saying, before you come here, here's what you should know about coming to a theater. And this is for mainly grade school audiences and their teachers. Um, but um, what we're finding as we work more and more deeply with um, other mainly adults and sometimes kids in our community who are, um, who are not used to accessing the arts, so we're doing a lot of deep community work right now with lower income communities over the last three years, and um, we're finding that uh, they also want some of this orientation, right? So we're, and it, it may not be that we are gonna hand them a pack and say, oh, you have to read this before you come in. There's other ways that we can um, indicate and kind of give cues and give help. Um, because frankly, working on the, walking onto the campus of Dartmouth feels weird. It just feels weird if you don't, if you're not already there. There's not a lot of signs. You're just supposed to know where you're going. It's kind of weird. It's a club, right? It's a private university. It's a club. So, <laughs> so we're really aware of that. We're really also aware of the language we're using when we are inviting people who aren't used to us in. That we're not like if you use a lot of complicated language and this kind of sophisticated academic language to frame the performance, like that is not going to help people feel welcome. And even if you talk about a performance in certain language, it doesn't feel welcome. It, the word invite is very powerful, and it's immediately understood that you want somebody to come. So there's, what I'm saying is like, yes, uh, we're really aware of this, this page to our study guide, and, but, and we're very aware of how much we need to use those same ideas kind of across the spectrum in terms of audience engagement. But the ways we do that are really gonna range. It's funny, on the, on the linguistic front, one of the words that I kind of hate the most is engagement. You know, like I think the idea is really powerful, but as an individual, as a person, I don't want someone to engage me. We don't. You we know? never use that word to the public. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. What, what besides invite, what what other words do you use to sort of frame this relationship? Well, in terms in terms of talking about the work, you know, I'm not going to maybe say that this comes out of the Beckett you know, influence on modern dramas, you know, <laughs> experimental, blah, 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 blah. That is just not helpful. So if it's a fun show, say it's a fun show. You know, that's okay. If it's funny, say it's funny. If it's great American roots music, you can say that. And that's a, a, an immediate point of, without talking down, of course. You know, you, you, these are grown-ups you're talking to, that's great. But like, it's okay to talk about the basics of what it feels like and what you love about a particular um, artistic experience. Anyone else? Any questions, thoughts? Yeah. Well, hello everyone. I'm I'm Albert from Barcelona. Mm -hmm. We are a we are a small company of theater that we just uh, we have been lucky enough to have a residence, but a production residence, in a festival of of, of Barcelona, but from street art, mm -hmm. and we did a theater piece there. But the thing um, where we, we it's a bit, a, a little bit uh, political, you know, it's it's a bit that at the end of that show, we want to make questions to the audience, so the audience leave um, the piece with some questions that they want to talk. There's there's, there's maybe like an a, a debate, I don't know, a debate uh, with the audience. So um, it's really interesting to talk about the context previously the, uh, the piece, but what about after? Do you do something else after this to, to really engage, sorry for the word, but <laughs> to really um, engage the audience and, and continue this process after the, the show has been played? We don't do it all the time. Because <laughs> there's just, I think, um, I think for us, it's just, there's just different kinds of programming. Mm -hmm. You don't see it as across the board, everything's the same, it should be the same. Um, but um, again, it's, it's really talking with our artists as to what is most comfortable for them in terms of advancing their art and advancing their own um, ability to um, generate new audience. So, um, I, you know, I, for us, it doesn't have to always happen, but there are definitely, when we program or we curate something, um, it seemed really timely. And I, I think, again, we, we can, um, as a team, we often draw upon each other, you know, the senior staff. Um, we kind of talk through 
what we're doing and how we can really shape it and, and introduce new audiences on our end, you know, our audience into something different. And how do we do that and is it appropriate? So I think, I think it might be helpful to work very closely with um, the curators and the presenters of wherever you are to see what the possibilities are. But I think it's also really important for artists to take control of that and say, I would like to contextualize my work this way. I want to take it outdoors. I don't think it's appropriate to do it indoors. I would like to see if there are other artists, you know, in the community who are doing work like this. And I think that's one of the big advantages of Brick is that we, we have so much resources. We're like, we constantly, like, we start thinking about gentrification and we're like, oh, boom, 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 boom. We're just throwing things at each other in terms of coming up with, you know, what's possible. But um, again, it's, I think it's really important for artists to be at the table to, to contextualize their own work, to be really smart about that as well. Yeah. Don't leave it to the presenters. Yeah. <laughs> it might not be the best idea. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes. Well, to, to, but to, 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 but to, be in a partnership. Exactly. Well, to add to that, mm -hmm. I mean, like we're, we're in the age where we have to wear all these different hats mm -hmm. now. So in a way, you know, we, we've gone, gone are the days where you just, you know, you write the songs that, you know, inspire you and walk down the street and then just, <laughs> yeah. you, you know, Somehow you write, it works, you write your right? lyrics on the toilet paper and hand them into, you know what I mean? You know, this, it's not like that anymore. You know, you have to think of yourself as um, a product, you know, which is something that we, is so foreign to an artist, you know, but you, the world is, is forcing you to think that way if you want to eat from your music, you know? And so um, I was going to mention that we had we did a, a, a concert, like a kind of theme uh, concert at the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts mm -hmm. in San Francisco. And, um, and we shared the stage with uh, La Santa Cecilia. Oh. And, um, and there were, uh, I think there were four acts all together that, that night. And what was amazing is, you know, one of the groups were local. And, um, but, you know, we were all kind of up and coming, you know, at that time. And the Santa Cecilia was the, you know, they were the, the headliners. But what was so special was um, the, the, the promoters, the organizers, what they ended up doing was a Q&A before the concert because the audience had not heard of our, our music collectively. You know, maybe some people, there were some fans, but in general, no. That had been our first time uh, in San Francisco performing, so we were newbies. Some of the people who were local were part of like a, a club scene you know, so they had a few fans, but not really. Um, and then, you know, uh, La Santa Cecilia was uh, performing there as well. I think, that, I think that might have been their first concert there. And so what was great was uh, they had a moderator who asked questions about all of us, where we came from, and we all shared this culture, this uh, indigenous culture from different perspectives, and we all shared our stories. And what was really special about it um, for all of us, because of course, you know, we're all so emotional, we're all like, you know, bawling our eyes out. All the bands were like, ah, you know, blubbering all over each other. Because most of the time when you do these concerts with other bands, you never get to see the other bands. Mm -hmm. You never get to spend time with the other bands because everyone's preparing their own thing to do their set, you know? And so to be able to hear from all of us and to hear everyone's story, it really, we formed friendships, you know? And that was super, super special. It was a way for us to connect not only just with the audience who really got into our music and were excited to hear what we had been talking about, learned our life stories, it was for us to learn about each other as well. So I do think it's great to have that Q&A thing. You know, I've done residencies where we, you know, after the concert, um, you know, some of the, the sponsors will have like a, an after thing, like a kind of after hang where we can talk you know, and we, I mean, for my band, we make it optional. Um, usually my particular band members will only go there if there's some you know, yeah, alcoholic yeah. beverages or, you know, something like that, or lots of food, you know. But um, we make that optional, but we, you know, people want to talk, they, they want to learn more, which is, I, I find really, really uh, encouraging. And in terms of, um, we, we tend to land um, on uh, always doing a Q&A at the end. Um, usually artists are kind of wanting to get ready before the concert. If we do something beforehand, it might be from some other guest speaker that really is contextualizing something that we feel is really critical. For example, I'm bringing a Hungarian theater company for the 
their first tour of the U.S. next January, and the piece is about um, uh, it's about life under communism in Hungary, right? Which I don't, I didn't really know a lot about, just as a person who grew up in California. Like, what do I, you know? What do I know? So there's a lot of nuance to that slice of history, and we want somebody to tell certain things to that audience before they see it, so that they can understand it. But then at the end, the Q and A will be with the artist. It's brief, but it's always there and we find that as a campus it's also a really remarkable thing because the students in the house and the, and the adults in the house they're asking different things and they're both actually learning from each other's questions and we're the only place on the campus where that can happen. So thinking about that, thinking about your question and the sort of the arc, if, uh, if a residency is a week long, uh, kind of where within the arc of that residency is the public performance. How much of the sort of contextualization work and mm -hmm. engagement happens before as sort of the lead in to prepare the audience for the performance? And then how much do you focus on things using the performance itself as a catalyst for other kinds of conversations and activities? I always want the show at the end because I want those streams to all converge and help support that performance. Mm -hmm. But if I can't get the hall on that exact day, there have been times where I'll say, well, the con you know, you'll be here Monday, Tuesday, the show is Wednesday, and then you're gonna do some more classes afterwards, and that's always fascinating. I don't start there, because I really want, I need the sales, I need the people to engage, but um, if it is happening afterwards, it's always super fascinating to go into those classes and hear people have the space and the time to actually respond, it's very lovely. I don't know, how's that? Yeah. Um, I, I, we've done some things where we'll have um, a stripped down version, you know, so say we'll have like a full band at the end of the week, but in the middle of the week we might have, you know, an acoustic thing where it'll be a trio, um, a lunchtime thing, and that sometimes can really be cool. And, and um, you know, and it's, some students will come, some won't or whatever, but you'll hear it and then people will say, oh, we heard you. You know, we were walking from one place to another, or, or whatever, but it sparked their ears, and then you find out that they that they're coming because they like what they heard. So it's all it all varies. Anybody? So, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the exchange, because I think you know so much of the conversation has been about the importance of the partnership between the artist and the presenter. Uh, what are what are the best things, I'm gonna first pose it to Martha and then we'll flip it. What are the most important things that a presenter can do to serve you as an artist in this planning mm -hmm. process? And then vice versa, from the presenter's point of view, what would be most valuable to, to get from the artist to create a successful partnership? Um. Well, I think um, the one thing is, you know, all of the, the interaction and planning and talking about, you know, getting into the crux of things and creating the schedule that really works, you know. But the main thing for an artist is, is um, repetition, you know, because people have that one gig, you have your week's residency and you have that one time and, and then you don't see those people again because they have their seasons, and then years and years have come after before you invite it back, and that can be difficult. You can't once you've established relationships with people, got to know you for a whole week, and learn about you, and then the whole town comes out, and it's a great night, you know, for whatever you know, arts council, whatever it is, and then um, you know, and then it's five years later right. before you ever hear of them again. And social media, you know, that's one thing, but you know, the people want to feel that night again. So if there was a way that we could be back every couple of years, you know, two, you know, two or three years, that would make the difference. Because a lot of people always say, when are you coming back? Oh, you know, when we love you, it's so much fun, and that kind of thing. And then by that time, it's like five years later, it's like, you're gone, you know? And then there are, you know, it's that kind of thing. So it's a funny, it's a funny relationship because some of, you know, the arts uh, presenters, you know, or, you know, festivals or these kinds of things, 
you know, sometimes when you hear, you know, their, their talk before the concerts begin, you know, they say, okay, here we are with blah, 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 and here we are in our, you know, our, our seventh year, blah, 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 we pride ourselves on never having any repeats. And we're like, well, thanks, you know what I mean? Because we're the opposite, you know, like we need those repeats. You know, that's how we build our audience. Yeah. So those two things are still not really gelling. Yeah. You know, we really need to be repeated. We need to be invited back. I use that uh, as an example for uh, New Orleans Jazz Fest. Um, New Orleans Jazz Fest, I think the first time I was invited was 2003 or 2004 to perform. And, um, and because it's the jazz and cultural side, um, we were invited to do a workshop um, for the, the Native American village part. You know, so they sent us out way out in the bayou and, and they bust in, you know, 300 kids from the bayou and we did a, a daytime workshop. Um, a tribe program, so did, did that. But we did that back in 2003 or, or four, and um, and it was such a, a success. We had a great time, and they really enjoyed the music. We were received really well. We were invited back the following year, you know. And then uh, the following year, uh, Katrina, Hurricane Katrina hit, so they skipped a year because they had all these big guys come in and stuff. But the year after, we were brought back again and again and again and again. So I've been invited to Jazz Fest five times, you know, and they don't care if it's the year before, you know what I mean? They don't care. They just like, we love you, you know, we want you to come back. And the last time <coughs> that we were there, we actually was, was the first time we were doing the Roots Project, you know, this William Blake thing. And so, um, um, you know, Quint Davis came up on stage and I literally fainted because he said, I'm gonna introduce you, you know? And so I nearly, you know, passed out at that, and, um, and he says, is this your first time here? I said, it's my fifth time here. And he goes, oh, we must love you then, you know, which is so cool, you know, but, but that is, you know, that's really important. It means a lot for musicians to, you know, to, for, for artists to be invited back with their piece or with a new piece and to develop the relationship with the, the venue, with the, the residencies, and to have this kind of uh, continued thing and new people are always going to come and stuff like that but there should be a way to kind of filter in some callbacks you know what yeah. I mean yeah I mean there's there's this kind of term that sometimes gets thrown around especially I think in the festival world uh, butterfly collecting and there's <laughs> you know certain mm -hmm. sense of like oh either Martha Redbone mm -hmm. check we've done mm -hmm. that yeah. or oh Cape Verde we've had an artist from Cape Verde check mm -hmm. so yeah. we're not going to have another Cape Verde yeah. artist and often and you know now, you know, at Joe's Pollock presented 500 shows a year, so it was easy to build these sort of recurring relationships with artists, Absolutely. develop those relationships, develop the audiences. That's right. In this case of you know, job at, uh, NYU and Abu Dhabi, we're presenting 20 residencies a year, so you don't, from the institutional standpoint, I don't want every season to look like the previous season. Right. You want it to be fresh. Mm -hmm. And so I think there is always that tension between sort of what serves the institution, what's serving the audience, and what's serving the artist. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was an interesting conversation this morning that I was in uh, with Ragamala Dance, uh, who we had in residence this year. Uh, the, the panel was on creative communication and commissions. And one of the points that Aparna Ramaswamy from, uh, from Ragamala made was about within the commissioning process, that almost exclusively happens with presenters with whom they've worked previously. And so you're building the trust and you're building that relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what, you know, Bone Hill, I think is a, is a good example, is because you had such a strong relationship with Joe's Pub and the Public Theater, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. where the, the comfort level to say, all right, now we're gonna commission you to do something you've never done mm -hmm. before and work together so that it continues the relationship, yeah. but doesn't feel like a retread of what you've done together previously. Actually, I, I, I'm curious about, uh, it makes me also think about um, situations where we are working on a more complicated project that's got a longer lead time and um, say we will find a way, sometimes on the cheap, but so be it, um, to bring an artist just for a visit. Just for a visit to do some, just to be on the campus for a couple days, um, Taylor Mac last March, then comes back and performs in September. By that point, they know something about us. Some people know them. It's incredible what even a really brief advance visit, even a year in advance, 
And you know, artists, if you can find a rounded way that they're not having to fly across the country just to come and be there, um, it's, it's, it's amazing it. because then they know that the word has started to go out and, and they're building their own community. You're giving them a chance to come in and start to make their time a year from then a, a total success. It's amazing how much you can accomplish <coughs> with that. Um, so, and I'm sure you guys have, you guys have multi-year relationships with some of the artists you work with and I'm sure they've come it's for Brooklyn. different sessions of time. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like being in Brooklyn. Everyone yeah. walks their hair. Yeah. Yes. Like I yes. see people. But more than once is yeah. my point. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think, I mean, I think it's so different than being up in Vermont, of course. <laughs> but, um, but I, you know, because Brick is, in downtown Brooklyn, it's artists are always in and out, yes, yes. and there are so many opportunities to do something quickly or something mm -hmm. longer. Mm -hmm. But yeah, very different. Mm -hmm. But we just yeah we we did something like that up, upstate New York, um, Earlville, New York, uh, Earlville Opera House, um, who booked us, and then they booked us. I think it was um, eight months in advance um, because there was a. Mm -hmm. And so, because of our, you know, tradition, because of the, the workshop that I do, we were able to do a workshop for them at the powwow for the kids, you know, in the town, which was great. And it was at uh, Colgate University, and we had a great turnout, you know, a really, really great turnout. And and a lot of the people who came said, you know, we already know you're coming. We're so excited, and some people are already said, we'll see you in eight months, you know. And I kind of looked at that like. Wow, that's really strange, you know, and I didn't really think about that. But when we came back and everyone was there, I mean, and just thrilled. We've been waiting, we've had so much fun at the powwow and we can't wait to see, you know. So, you know, in small remote places, that can really work when they don't mm -hmm. get very much music going on. And also our agent managed to route it to make it worth our while. So it was, you know, on, on the way to something and we had, you know, two or three we had a really nice run from, from that. So it can, it can really work. And, and when you're in places like, um, you know, out in the middle of nowhere, where you have to sometimes drive four and five hours, um, those things really matter because the people are, are, they want music, they love music, they love the arts, they love theater pieces, they love everything. You know, they go to their local coffee place and, and sit and hear, you know, people strumming guitar just to hear, just to be around live music. Mm -hmm. And you really, for me, you, I, I believe that that's, you know, the live music scene is, is people are starved of it, you know? you know? Can I ask a question to everybody? I mean, I'm curious, I mean, we're talking about creating context for the work, right? So have people been in experiences either at their own venues or with their own artists or just as a person out there where you felt like, whoa, they didn't create any context for this. Something didn't happen here. Have you ever kind of been caught up short where you're like, wow, I'm either I'm not really understanding this isn't what I thought it was coming to at all, or no, it's always imperfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I, I was actually going to ask something that's related. So your question um, is interesting. I was wondering what happens when you create context, but it still doesn't, it doesn't match the audience's experience and, and what do you do to resolve that tension? Um, especially because, I mean, so I, I work with Bill, so I guess this is cheating um, in the Middle East, but, um, but you know, we, we have a, an interesting time of, of um, bringing artists uh, from so many different situations into a crowd who doesn't even really know that they want art or what kind of art they want to see or listen to. Um, and we, uh, we're creating context for it all the time, and obviously it goes over well in the majority of cases, but it, there's always points at which it misses, and so I'm wondering if you can talk about times where you feel like the context didn't, didn't, didn't work and what you learned from that. Wait, something didn't work? <laughs> I'm not saying something didn't work. I'm talking about individual cases for individual people. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I have no <laughs> So, okay. So I'm, I'm Cherokee, Shawnee, Choctaw, African American. And you know, when you're um, in a partridge in a pear tree, but when you are, um, when you're, when you look black, mm -hmm. you know, people sometimes can't understand that, you know, even though I was raised by my mom and, you know, speak language and all this kind of stuff. 
So anyway, I did a gig out in, uh, we were invited um, to do a gig out in the, the Choctaw Reds, you know, Choctaw country. And so um, we did a community outreach, you know, we did a workshop for the kids and singing and all kinds of stuff and meet, meet and greet and all of that. And then we ended up um, being uh, an opening act for um, a, like a serious, like, you know, flag waving, Confederate flag waving, a uh, country music band, you know, <laughs> who, who, were, who were sponsored by, um, you know, Jack Daniels, you know? And, um, and it was so interesting because, you know, the, all of the stuff was like certain things that were going on, you know, like alcoholism, alcoholism is so strong, you know, in, in Indian country and like, you know, like eight of my, my great uncles and aunt, uh, you know, aunts are dead from it, you know, so all of these things are, you know, came into play. And so we were the opening act, and so there were um, seven of us, you know, me, my English husband, and, <laughs> you know, and five brothers from, you know, Chicago, Fred Catch, and, you know, all these guys, you know? And so we walked into the dressing room, which was like a big kind of common area, and, you know, we just say hi, and these kind of cowboys sitting there, we said hi, and they just kind of looked, and it was just frosty, the snowman, you know? And then we got on stage, so we were the opening act, and we got on stage, and, and at that time, we had our, um, it was our funk band, you know, so it was like Native Soul and stuff, so we had chants and all this kind of like, earth, wind, and fire on the res, music, basically. <laughs> and, um, and we were in an audience with, you know, 10-gallon hats and handlebar, Mustaches was like, this ain't no country music, you know. And we were, I mean, I mean, we were not well received at all, you know, at all. It was a bad match, all in the name of being native, you know, and to, native to that area. And um, so we were just, you know, that was just a bad, bad gig for us, you know, in, in every possible way, um, creatively, you know. Um, you know, even though I'm Choctaw, you know, my grandpa's from there, so it's, it was like not. And so to the point where the audience, and this is an audience of, um, you know, because it was in their kind of amphitheater, so it was probably about, I would say at least like 2,000 people or something, you know, who were there to see this kind of like real, you know, like seriously, you know, Republican, white Republican, Southern Bible Belt, Group, yeah, you know, and um, so that was a, that was really really interesting. So, in, in given given being dealt those cards, mm -hmm. and which seems like a curatorial yes. problem, yes, are there certain things that you can imagine could have been done to take perhaps a poor curatorial choice to have reframed it? Is there a way that can you imagine a scenario by which that could have been turned into a success? <laughs> no, seriously. No, I mean, like, I, you know, because you know, a lot, a lot of the programming that I do, and I think you know, with Global Fest, and you know, often putting artists together that don't seem to naturally fit together has been very often a curatorial approach that I've taken, mm -hmm. and letting kind of letting people find connections that might only exist in my mind, but <laughs> often you know can kind of spark different things. So I'm just wondering if kind of within within that. You know, perhaps you know. Is, is there a scenario where where there's an opportunity for that to be turned into something that was a more positive experience? Um, Can anybody here that, think of any ideas that might have been able to kind of generate that, that night. <laughs> <laughs> But I tell you what, though, yeah. I did I did do not that that particular thing did not work because we were in a very conservative Christian. Um, Bible Belt part of the country, there was nothing that we could have done to have saved that. You know, we just did what we had to do. It was, you know, serious, serious. But however, you know, we have, um, we did uh, do a concert of it. It's a Creek Nation Festival. That was absolutely amazing. They had two nights, you know, the first night was, um, you know, some big country music names and all this stuff. And then they had a native artist who did, did country music, you know, and then the following night, was um, the headliner was uh, uh, Buddy Guy, the Jacksons, the Ohio Players, mm -hmm. and me. 
as the opener. That was a great, you know, that was amazing. So they knew what to do. You know, they kind of had redneck night and black night. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it kind of worked. I mean, it really, really seriously worked. And people loved it. And, you know, the Creek Nation is different, though, because they're, you know, they're, they're um, multi you know, multiracial as well and, and stuff. And, and it's just a, di a different vibe, you know? And there's a lot of love. And they also made it um, free, you know? And that really made a big difference. And it was like a huge fair, you know, they had stuff for the kids, they have all traditional stuff. You know, it was just, it's absolutely spectacular. And so, so yeah. yeah, it is planning, it is curatorial. Yeah. So, sometimes with um, potentially disastrous moments in terms of conceptualization, it's because we're presenting something very contemporary, and actually I would love to hear what Jackie has to say, because she's <laughs> mainly doing contemporary work, um, where we are trying to race ahead to somehow keep our audience in a loop <laughs> as we learn things about the show that we didn't know. You know so like um, one of the most brilliant um, uh, uh, indigenous New Zealand artist, Lemmy Ponifacio, who does these very contemporary, large scale dance performances kind of informed by Bhutto. And you know, I, I learned, and no one's ever seen him before, so I'm, I'm working hard to just explain <laughs> where he's coming from and what his expression is and what to expect without giving it away and still getting people in, right? Because you just don't know. So, you know, like five days before the performance, I find out that it starts with an extremely loud explosion sound, like very loud, in the dark, before the lights have even come up, which could make the people think that there's a bomb in the building, right. and I'm not kidding. And that um, it ends with a giant dump of like, thousands of pounds of powder that then kind of cloud out into the audience. Okay, these two things. So, so what are you gonna do, right? But you have to be, so that's the moment that you're scrambling and you're trying to get a letter or an email to absolutely everybody so that they know and they know that you're taking care of them. And so that's a whole nother, it, it, it's not so artistic, <laughs> but it's because of the artistry that you're trying to keep your audience contextualize as to what they can expect with something that's totally a new experience. Yeah. Do you have, uh, I'm sure you have comparable. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think this is really um, interesting in terms of how artists are selected. And um, because we do contemporary art, um, often the conversation is about how, how the artist is impacting or reflecting contemporary life. So it could be contemporary situations, but somehow, where does it, where is it? Where does this thing, you know, this thing that we want to bring in, how, where does it sit in today's contemporary experience? And then also um, talking about the art artistic process, because we are lending so much of our resources to that process, we need to understand it completely first before we just say, oh yeah, come, you can do that. Um, and I think that's where, um, that's where, 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 where we're kind of interviewing and looking at artists that it, it's really important to understand what that artistic process is so we can explain it better and we understand why the explosion is now happening mm -hmm. before yeah. then. <laughs> you know? um, so that we could better support them and, um, and we understand our audience because mm -hmm. we're programming. So I think all that needs to happen before we, we have to ask the questions ourselves and then have the artist answer them and see if we're satisfied with the answers so that we could program it. It's all about really communicating. Yeah, yeah. And, and the artist being really articulate <laughs> yes. about what it is that they're doing. Clear, yeah, which yeah, is cause, the case too. And, and I think yeah. the other thing is the, the question of the, the question of trigger warnings, you know, yeah. like literal trigger warnings or not. <laughs> you know, like I, I, I brought Taylor Mack to the David Rubenstein Atrium at Lincoln Center and part of the 24-hour history of American popular music he's creating is the incorporation of burlesque dancers. And even though it's an indoor space, it's a public space. And so at some point, he told me that he was bringing <coughs> a preeminent boylesque dancer who generally gets fully naked. Mm -hmm. And so we had to have a sort of a whole conversation about what's going to happen when Tigger shows up. And Taylor is really, really strongly opposed to any kind of trigger warnings. He hates curtain speeches. He hates things that are going to then, you know. That mediate what he's yeah. trying to reach out And yeah. so the kind of what's the proper way to sort of prepare the audience who are coming, especially in a free context, with lots of different mm -hmm. histories and expectations mm -hmm. and relationship to that. Uh, you know, and I've seen it also within uh, 
again, the, the, the context, because we're talking about context, mm -hmm. uh, of being in a, in a venue where people are getting tickets that are, kind of, that are set, or when it's kind of free and kind of open to the public, people are coming and going. Uh, I presented Camille Brown. Uh, mm -hmm. No, no, it wasn't Camille Brown. Well, actually, two different stories. So Camille Brown uh, presented uh, Mr. Tolerance at Lincoln Center Out of Doors, a free festival, and she deals very directly with blackface and with the history mm -hmm. of minstrels, you know, and deals with issues that are still very, very, very complicated in the US, uh, uses a lot of language that is very charged, and is being shouted over PA in a public park, where not only do you have the audience who are <laughs> there, but you have audiences who are sort of coming yeah. by. All and ages. For, for yeah. Camille, yeah. there is a Tourist. conversation <laughs> that is, you know, the post-show the post conversation is not situated as a post-show conversation. It's situated as, this is the third act of the piece. It is an integral part of the piece. It is not separate from the piece. And so what we did is we had a lot of conversations with our security guards uh, and you know, who function as our house staff and said, if people complain about the language, if people complain about the representation, uh, acknowledge that, that yes, we understand that there are kind of difficult issues that, that will make people uncomfortable. Uh, and please stay around for the conversation to talk about that. And that we actually kind of said, we're not going to apologize for it. We're not going to apologize for the language. We're not going to apologize for the piece. We're going to say that your response, you know, that many different responses are going to be valid. Uh, and please be part of that conversation. Let's use that moving forward. And that, that's really kind of integral to her work. Sometimes we get blindsided. Kyle Abraham, we, we presented a piece uh, which was based on Boys in the Hood, Pavement. Uh, and I had seen it at, uh, at Harlem Stage, and it's an incredible piece. It's based on a, you know, a gang film, uh, and there's gun violence as part of it. I didn't think about it uh, when we were doing our tech rehearsal, and all of a sudden gunshots started echoing through a public park in New York City. Uh, yeah. <laughs> everybody freaked out, because again, that context of what happens with something that you understand is a theatrical cue mm -hmm. because you're seeing it in a yeah. theater. Right. Uh, but again, post Bataclan, even that question of you right. know when mm -hmm. real world violence can yeah. intrude mm -hmm. changes now. But there, what we ended up having to do is we worked with our security department. Uh, we tracked exactly when every gun cue was in the sound design. Uh, and they put out an APB through the entire New York City police system mm -hmm. that if gunshots are reported in the vicinity of Damarsh Park at this time, this time, and this time, know that they're theatrical in nature. You know, but again, it's like the kind of thing where you just, I had never and thought there you about have that it. before. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Trigger warnings. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, but, you know, but I think, you know, even the, the question of, you know, who you're presenting for and how much they have chosen to be in that audience mm -hmm. and how much they might be an accidental audience or be happen mm -hmm. happening upon it, uh, how much they are familiar with the art or the artist or the art form, mm -hmm. and how much they're like, oh, it's a free festival, let me come check this out. Uh, like all of those things I think also sort of change mm -hmm. how I have to think about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I find that I present a lot of international work, including theater, and I find it's really um, appreciated by the audience if I can help them understand where does this director fit into the world of theater in their country because how else are we supposed to know you know so even if it's getting a faculty member to talk for a little bit before but like here's what's been going on in Chile mm -hmm. since the you know, since, right. since Pinochet it's been like this and now we have a generation of people who are doing this kind of work and this person you're gonna see kind of fits in right over here like it's just really helpful the kind of just get some grip on what you're, not even literally what you're gonna see, but just kind of where does this person fit in? Mm -hmm. That's a whole other kind of context. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, perhaps uh, I, um, Jan, Jackie spoke a lot about getting, letting the artist take the driver's mm -hmm. seat, but perhaps one question a presenter can ask an artist is, what are the questions you get? Like, because mm -hmm. I know that as a South Asian mm -hmm. woman, there are questions that I'm gonna get that you, like someone else might not realize that a South Asian yeah. person's gonna get asked. Yeah. You know, and it's just because you've just heard the question so many mm -hmm. times that you keep answering mm -hmm. and going, hey, here's something that can be a context. Yeah. So or good, needs context. Or so needs context. So yeah. given that there are certain sort of recurring themes that as you and your artists are traveling around <coughs> or they keep coming up, 
do you then put that into the rider, or do you wait for there be a presenter who's savvy enough to ask you those questions, or do you actually kind of in your in your tour packet in your marketing materials are you then putting in an FAQ, or are you putting in kind of your own kind of study guide, presenting guide? Well, we have our own study guides. Right? Mm -hmm. So we have several artists that are exemplary teaching artists. So I actually, mm -hmm. if, the, if the presenter's not even thinking about outreach work, I will push them to be thinking about our outreach mm -hmm. work and going, please, let's include mm -hmm. something. We have a time slot, let's, let's make this happen. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really me being aware of can the artists do it well as well, not trying to force fit it just because mm -hmm. they're doing South Asian stuff, mm -hmm. yeah. right? It's making sure that they do it well, but mm -hmm. like we have a group like Ria Skavali, which deals with is Islamic music, and right now it's with Islamophobia. There's, it's a, there's a really wonderful kind of contextual link, and we do have teaching artists, so we were, when we were gonna, we, they're on the, they got the Mid-Atlantic Touring Grant where you have to mm -hmm. do community engagement, so we did a call with all the presenters that were going to be part of the consortium, the artist and myself, and just talk through a lot of different ideas. And, but for my teaching artists, I literally have like a menu of mm -hmm. like, yes, they do music and dance, but they also do gender studies. They also do kinesiology. Like, you know, here are all the other unusual places that they can also mm -hmm. be, mm -hmm. um, just to spark that conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a question for you and for, for you too, but when you are preparing to program something that you know probably no one in your community is, is, is familiar with, what kind of marketing do you do like before the artist even arrives? And not necessarily with the residency connections, but just with ticket sales. Like how do you, what's your... Well, I think uh, we present the season as a whole. So, this, so that season brochure, um, it goes out in July for the entire, all the way through the next, you know, fall through the end of May. So there's cues in this, but of course there's very limited space. Mm -hmm. um, we've started actually to make our website deeper so that you can click for more, and then you can get actually several pages more of contextual information about each of those shows, including what you're asking about. Um, and then it's really how can we find some real estate um, that people are looking at or listening to to kind of start telling that context story and um, you know it, of course you have a news release and if you're lucky somebody uses it and then you can, you know, you can it, it's, it's a lot of traditional methods of marketing mm -hmm. but it's really being careful and uh, explicit and clear about what the context is that you need people to know great example last week I presented Dr. Brock on Wednesday night this is a Ukrainian, almost like a Ukrainian punk band. They're taking tradition, but they're completely turning it around, and they're making up their own tradition and wearing crazy, you know, they're just amazing. And they spent a couple of days of residency on campus, um, uh, but I realized like the day before they got there that my marketing director had been doing everything right. I'm very involved in like, I proof everything, I make sure that it's the right nuance, or the, no, no, not like that, don't use that word. It's like, no, no, don't, don't say piercing voices, don't, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she's amazing, I will, anyway, so she's, a, she's really good. But, um, but anyway, um, I realized that their recordings, like the actual just audio recordings that they produce tend to be very avant-garde, like really experimental. And that those were what we had shared with some of the press. I don't know if they listened to them or not, but like you really have to look at every piece of the message that you're letting out there. And if you don't know what's on every single CD this person's put out, like really be aware of what, which is the one that is the most likely concert experience that you're going to use. So like what exact tool all along the way are you going to use? Mm -hmm. Uh, side note, Dr. Rafa <coughs> are actually playing tonight. They're at, so great. They're so great. Uh, Global Fest alums, uh, and they're playing at Brooklyn Bowl tonight mm -hmm. at the Riot Artists Let's Agency. See so see them there. Let's see them. Kind of incredible. Uh, and this has been fantastic, and I think we're out of time, but I want to thank Jackie Chang and Martha Ridbone and Margaret Lawrence and all of you for the impact. We're going to a home stretch, so enjoy the rest of the conference. And, uh, and continue to kind of share any information that you thought might be of value on Twitter, Instagram, whatever. Hashtag APAPNYC. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you all.